Hi, welcome to our online service. At Cross Community Church, it's our mission to grow up as disciples of Christ, to grow together through fellowship with other believers, and to grow out by sharing the good news of Jesus with our community and around the world. Now, let's worship together. Blessed time that's coming, coming soon. And it may be evening, morning, or in noon. The wedding of the bride united with the groom. We shall see the king when he comes. Yes. 
should the Savior call today? Would Jesus say, well done, don't go away? My home is full of your the vine will never stay. We shall see the King when he comes. We shall see, we shall see the King. We shall see the King. We shall see the King when He comes. He is coming in power. We'll hail the blessed hour. We shall see the King when He comes. Brother, sister, are you ready for the call? To crown your Savior, King and Lord of all.
Cause you're the God of the breakthrough When I'm breaking down You'll be working the way through When there's no way out This one thing I know You're still on your throne So whatever I'm feeling I've still got a reason to praise anybody got a reason to praise the Lord this morning let's praise him all creatures all creatures of our God and King lift up your voice and we'll sing a big shout of praise to Jesus our Lord. He is worthy of all praise. God, we praise you because you have created each one of us. You have created this world that we live in. Every star in the sky, every planet that surrounds our sun, every galaxy, and yet you know each one of us by heart. You know the number of hairs on our head. 
So God, we thank you that we have the privilege and the honor of knowing you personally. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to be forgiven of our sins and to live with you for all of eternity. For that, we praise you, God. And no matter what else happens, we still have a reason to praise our God. Amen. Could we praise him one more time, church? Hallelujah. Well, now's the time to step out of your seats and greet one another this morning. My name is Cody, and I want to welcome you to Cross Community Church. If you are joining us for the first time, we are so glad you are with us today. Can we please give our guests a really big welcome? If you are new, we would love to get to know you. So please fill out an in touch card for us, which can be found in the seat pocket in front of you. You can hold on to it, drop it off at our welcome desk out in the foyer for a free gift. Today, we want to celebrate two missions efforts that you have made possible. In the wake of Hurricane Ian, we have collected $3,275 so far to help those greatly affected by the storm. And 100% of those funds have been sent for relief efforts in Southwest Florida through the Church of God. Yesterday, Pastor Brian, also my husband, um, participated in the Florida Bike Ride for Missions, riding 52 miles to raise money for world missions efforts in Africa. 26 riders participated, coming from across Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee, raising over $20,000 for Nigeria and Zambia. Pastor Brian's personal goal was $1,000, and we will be sending in his total this week. So if you haven't given yet, and you would like to contribute, please mark your donations today for Missions Bike Ride. Those are all the announcements for today. Please check your bulletin for all the great details of things happening here at Cross Community Church. Now let's continue in worship with scripture reading and in prayer. Let's stand and give the Lord a wave offering because he's worthy this morning. You know, I worship God this morning because he looks beyond my fault and see my needs. Somebody need to give him a clap offering now. Somebody need to thank the Lord for his goodness. This morning we're alive and well and it is enough to give God thanks for this morning. I'm going to uh, give my, the mic to my husband. He'll read the scripture and then I'll pray. Good morning. Bless you. Scripture lessons taken from John 15, verse 5. And this reminds me, I like to plant. Whatever I can plant, I love to do it. And I like to see them bear. But even if they don't bear, I need to work on them. Whether I trim them, cut them, or even uproot them and throw them out. But I need to see progress. Amen? Amen. So, the word of God is taken from John 15, verse 5. And it says, let us read together. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Bless the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. 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 Let us bow our hearts in, as we pray. Lord God, I exhort you. I exhort your name. Thou art worthy to receive glory, to receive honor and praise. Father, we just thank you that you have brought us here one more day. And so God, we come with our cups turned up to be filled by you. God, we pray that you will meet us at the point of every need. This morning, we thank you that you are the husband man. You dress us. You know us by name and number. You said you know every year. You, you number them on our heads. So you know us inside out. God, I cannot fool you, and no one here can fool you. But Lord God, you specialize, God, in the things that man look at as impossible. And so this morning, we ask you, God, to touch that broken heart, to heal that wounded, broken spirit. 
Father God, we ask you, God, to touch that mind, Lord God, that is depressed. Father, we ask you, God, to touch the body that is broken. Lord Jesus, we ask you, Lord God, that you minister to us in a new way. Show us how to love. You are the God of love. And love look beyond fault and see need, God. You love us so much that you engrave us in the palm of your hand. You love us so much, God, that you call us royalty priesthood a peculiar people you love us so much mighty God that you have you have us as the apple of your eyes hallelujah oh hallelujah thank you Jesus a mighty God we are not worthy of the nail that went through your son's hands we are not worthy of that crown of thorn but this morning God we come to give you glory and to give you praise visit us God move among us Touch us in a new way. Help us, God, to go out in the highways and byways. Minister to our neighbors. Minister to our co-workers. Minister to the lost. God, you have no hands but ours. You have no feet but ours. You have no voice but ours. And so, mighty God, we ask you to use us for your glory. Those who are here, God, who need a revival, who need a touch, God, do it again for us. That we, Lord God, will give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say. Amen. Let the people of God say. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why should I worry? Giants come calling my name. My God is so much bigger than troubles I face. Why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? My God is so much better than all of these things. So I won't be shaken, and I won't be moved. My God is faithful, His promise is true. So I There's no mountain too high, there's no valley too high. 
You know, there was really one reason that Jesus came into this world. When he was born and conceived in the womb of a virgin through the work of the Holy Spirit, he was born in order to die, in order to reconcile humanity with God, in order to bridge the chasm between a holy God and a sinful man, in order to go to a cross, in order to pay the atoning price required by a holy God for the sins of the world. And we believe at this church that Jesus was crucified on a real cross in Palestine outside the walls of Jerusalem, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. And when he was raised, he ascended into heaven. And he is at the right hand of the Father now, ever living to make intercession. And he's coming again. But between the time Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, and until he comes again, the Christian church needs to be asking herself, what are we to do in the world in which we live? Well, we can go to a bunch of church planting conferences, and we can go to the next church growth movement seminar. We can figure out how to build a church and create an experience or an environment that is going to attract people. Or we can simply look to the Bible and we can see what Jesus did with the truth that he had, and he proclaimed that truth. And when he proclaimed that truth, he did not mince his words. He called people to repent. He called people to believe in him. He called people to get their hearts right. He called people to yield themselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This parable that I'm gonna to read to you this morning is found in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was one of those gospels that was written to show that Jesus is, was, and will always be King of the Jews, that he was the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. You read the Gospel of Matthew and you see that John the Baptist was the forerunner. He was the one that went out and proclaimed, there is one coming after me. I baptize you, he said, in water, but there's one coming after me who's going to baptize you in fire and he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. We see that when Jesus' ministry came into blossom that he was preaching the Gospel and he was declaring the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom of heaven was not contingent upon political prowess or the political acceptance of the day. He, he preached a whole revolutionary message that God must reign in the hearts and souls of every mankind. He preached the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever thought about that? What does that mean? The kingdom of God refers to the rule of God in every sphere of society, every sphere of culture every sphere of your life and every sphere of my life. Jesus preached the whole series of sermons known as the Sermon on the Mount beginning in Matthew 5, ending in Matthew 7. And in that sermon series, perhaps the greatest sermon series that has ever been preached explained what it looks like when the kingdom of heaven is lived out in real time. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, you know that the religious figures of his day, they did not accept the clear teachings of Jesus. Oh, the more things change, the more they stay the same, don't they? I mean, we're witnessing today a pandemic of rejecting the Word of God, not allowing our hearts to be receptive to the truth and the clear teachings of Scripture. And they rejected the truth of God's word. And Jesus performed miracles. They witnessed these miracles. And that just lets me know that a miracle for the sake of a miracle will not convert or save anyone. We all have to make that decision that we're going to turn to God and we're going to embrace him and trust him. And so here Jesus is proclaiming the gospel. Here he is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Here he is performing miracles. Here he is conversing with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the religious folk of his time. 
And they end up saying that he's doing the work that he's doing by the power of Satan. And Jesus flips the script. He goes from telling them illustrative narratives to speaking to them in parables. And in Matthew chapter 13, we have the first of many parables. And that's why today I want to expand on this parable. For the sake of time, somebody asked me if I could do a sermon in a second, and I cannot do that. (laughs) They asked me if I could do a message in a minute, and I'm not capable of that either. But since we've gathered together today, this is the Lord's day, and we're in God's house for the express purpose of receiving the words of God that we might know who he is and how to live for him. And I want to look at this parable this morning and I want to hang it on four truths. And all of these truths are going to come specifically from the text. It's a lengthy text, but we have plenty of time. I believe that I'm standing in front of a group of men and women who you're here today because you want to be here. You're here today because you're serious about worshiping Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth, and you want to leave here today empowered by God, empowered by the Spirit, empowered by His truth. I want to suggest to you that if you will listen to the text, if you will listen to the message that is contained in the parable of the sower, you will understand four profound truths that will radically change your life. And the first truth is this. In this parable, we learn the truth that this parable is actually teaching us a principle. What is this principle? I want to direct your attention this morning to Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. I want to read these words in your hearing, and I'm going to ask you to give your entire attention to the Word of God. We read these words beginning in verse 1 of Matthew 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got in a boat and he sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and when he sowed, some seed fell among the path. And the birds of the air came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground. And when they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun arose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withdrew away. And other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on the good soil and produced grain. Now listen to this, brothers and sisters. Some produced a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. The flowers of the field fade and the grass withers away, but not the word of our Lord. It stands forever, and you can trust it. You must trust it. You have to trust it. Today, some of you are at a fork in the road. You've got to make a decision. And let it not be said of me or you that any of us in here refuse to hear what Jesus has to say. You know, these words were penned by a gospel writer by the name of Matthew. And God has preserved this word down through the annals of history. He's preserved it through the person and the work of the Holy Spirit so that we could gather today in the 21st century and hear the Word of God. And the Word of God speaks. And this text tells us about a profound principle. Some scholars say this is a parable of the sower. Some say it's a parable of the seed. Others say it's a parable of the soil. I suppose that each of those insights are correct. But today, I want to lean on the latter of those three interpretations, and I want to speak to you this morning about the parable of the sower, but how it refers to the condition of the soil. It's interesting that in the passage of Scripture I just read to you, that as Jesus was speaking to them in a parable, he used an agrarian illustration because he was in an agrarian culture. 
He wasn't preaching to people who were living in the concrete jungles of Manhattan. He wasn't speaking to people, per se, that were in a metropolitan area, even though this is definitely apropos for any metropolitan area in the 21st century. But Jesus was speaking to them using an agricultural parable. And he said to them, the principle in this parable is that a sower went out to sow seed. Inevitably, he must be speaking in this context about himself. But you do know that all of us are called to go out and sow seed, don't you? I mean, you, you do understand by now that you are the evangelist. You are the ambassadors. You are the emissaries of God. You have a responsibility to leave wherever your context of influence is, wherever God has given you some type of geographical boundary to eat and to live and to work and to interact with human beings, you have a responsibility to sow this seed and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And he said that his sower went out to sow seed, and the text says that there were four kinds of soil. First, that some seed just fell by the wayside. You remember what the text said, right? He sowed the seed. Can you imagine in this ancient Palestinian culture, the sower just walking constantly through the rows of the field, grabbing seed out of his knapsack and just broadcasting it continually from row to row, and some of the seed fell on stony ground. That would have been indicative of the path that many people would have walked. In those days, those fields were sown in rows, and the rows are where the crops were grown, but in between the rows, you had these walkways, and this is the, this is the hard ground that some of the seed fell on, and, and the text says that it just fell there, and it didn't do anything but get eaten up by the birds of the air. And then, then there was that one soil that, that would fall among the rocky soil. I lived in the Bahamas, and I understand a little bit about rocky soil. He's not referring to soil with a few rocks in it. He's referring rather to this type of land that had a very shallow amount of soil on a bed of solid rock. And some of the seed would fall on this stony ground, and because it had a little bit of a soil, it would spring up, but it wouldn't last very long. And then some seed, he said, fell among the thorns, and the thorns choked it out. And then some seed fell among good soil, and the text said that that seed produced an extensive bumper crop to the amount of 30, 60, or 100-fold. I hope you can see that in this parable that Matthew is recording and giving to his readers that he's making a logical sequential argument about the condition of the soil. Let me ask you a question this morning. When you think about the principle of the soil, how are you doing with that? Are you an individual that is totally receptive to the Word of God? Someone that I pastored years and years ago in another church in another state. I pastored this individual for a number of years, prayed with them, shared the gospel with them, counseled them, spoke with them, and I knew all that they were going through. I knew all that they were struggling with, all of their addictions, all of their shortcomings, everything. And I spoke with this person recently, and they confided in me that they have now chosen to enter into a same-sex relationship. And I said to this person whom I know and care deeply about, I love him like a brother. I said to him, and before I could finish my statement, he said, I know. I know what the Bible says. I know what you're going to say. I know what the church says. But this is what I want. I looked at him and I said to him, I love you. I'm always going to be here for you, but I fear for the eternal state of your soul because now your heart has become so hardened that you are now justifying your sin and rejecting the authority of God's word. Jesus gave this parable, and he was speaking within the context of these obstinate, recalcitrant, hard-hearted Pharisees that had rejected his authority and his message outright. And he began to speak to them in a parable. And the principle not only was about the sower, not only about the seed, 
but about the condition of the soil. That's the first truth that we find in Matthew 13. But we find another truth in Matthew 13. It is a truth not only about a parable and a principle, it is the truth about a parable and a prophecy. You might ask the question, why is Jesus speaking in a parable? After all, if you know anything about the teachings of Jesus, you knew that he was an illustrative teacher. He knew how to connect with his audience and he knew how to use images and imagery and metaphors and contrast and comparisons and similes and all of these figures of speech in order to connect with his audience. But now he's speaking to them in a parable. If you look up the word parable, you'll know that it has, it comes from two compound words. It comes from the word balo, which means to throw or to cast or to lay. And then it comes from the word para, which means alongside of. Here's what a parable actually is. A parable is an earthly story with heavenly meaning. And Jesus is giving a story. And parables are meant to cause those who have rejected the message to be able or unable to understand the parable. And only those who are willing to accept it as the truth and delve into it can understand it. So it's now become judgmental. Jesus now has passed judgment on those who refuse to accept his word. You don't have to agree with this. If I'm wrong, I would humbly acknowledge it. It is my opinion that we're witnessing today in our culture God's passive judgment. It is my opinion that according to Romans 1, God has said, if you want to continue to suppress and reject the truth, I'm simply going to remove my constraining forces. I'm going to lift my hand and I'm going to let you have your way. It strikes fear in me to think that God would ever allow me to have my way. My self-centeredness, my individualism, my ego, the flesh in me, I often want my way, but one thing I pray daily, and I wanna share this with you because maybe to help you, I pray daily that God would grant me repentance of any sin that may be in my heart that I'm not aware of, because I'm aware of many of them, but I don't know everything that's in my heart, but God does, that he would grant me that repentance, and that he would grant me faith to believe him, and that he would grant me the power of the Holy Spirit to turn to him, and to never develop a hard heart. And I want you to notice what we read in this parable, because Jesus now says this, in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 13, excuse me, beginning in verse 10, when the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to you who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but you will not understand. And you will indeed see, but you will not perceive. For the people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. You know about Isaiah, don't you? He's one of the major prophets. He's one of the prophets that God raised up to speak to the nation of Israel, particularly the southern kingdom of Judah. They had witnessed the demise and the division of Israel around 722, excuse me, around 922 BC after the death of Solomon. They witnessed Assyria ransack the northern tribe of Israel in 722 and obliterate them, never to be found again. Vestiges and remnants of that were found in the New Testament when we see Jesus' interaction with the Samaritans. The Samaritans were the result of the interracial marriages and relationships between the Assyrians and the Israelites. They're gone, never to be seen again. 
And God raised up Isaiah to speak to the southern kingdom of Judah and said, judgment's going to come on you if you don't turn and repent and receive the message of Yahweh. You know the story. Israel thought they were smarter than God. Judah said it might have happened to Israel, but it's not going to happen to us. And God allowed Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian empire to come in around 586 and totally carry them into Babylonian captivity. The difference between them and the northern tribe of Israel is that God allowed them to return from exile and to start rebuilding the wall and the temple in Jerusalem. God is merciful and gracious. Have you experienced God's mercy and grace today? He is merciful, he's gracious, and he's patient. And even when he judges, he does so in order to redeem. And some of you have experienced this in a profound first way manner, amen? We ought to give God an ovation of praise for his faithfulness this morning. He is so very, very, very good to us. And so Jesus is now explaining to them why he's preaching in a parable. He's preaching in a parable to fulfill biblical prophecy. There's many reasons why I believe the Old Testament, but one of them is because Jesus quoted from it so frequently, and he himself believed in the Old Testament. It doesn't matter that the JEPD theory that arose in the academic circle back in the day questioned the Pentateuch and questioned the Torah. And it doesn't matter that liberal theologians would question the veracity and the validity and the believability of Scripture. We know that Scripture is true. There's internal evidence, there's external evidence, there's historical evidence, and most of all, there's spiritual evidence because when you believe the Word, as the authority of God's Word, the Holy Spirit begins to work in you in a very profound way. And so when you think about the principle and you think about the prophecy that this text is referring to, it causes us today to want to heed the Word of God, or at least it ought to. If I were you, I would read the Bible daily. I would read the Bible carefully. I would read the Bible prayerfully. I would read the Bible systematically. There is no other way to grow spiritually. We think in the Pentecostal and charismatic church that we can just go from experience to experience or that somehow or another spiritual maturity and development is going to occur through osmosis. It doesn't happen that way. Jesus spoke to his audience and said, your heart must be good soil in order for the Word of God to take root in and to bear much fruit. But if you refuse to accept God's Word, here's what inevitably will happen to you. You will have ears to hear, but you will not hear. The ear, nose, and throat doctor can tell you that your hearing is perfect, but you will not hear the Spirit of God. You will not hear the voice of God because you and I have turned a deaf ear to the Word of God. The optometrist and the ophthalmologist may tell us that without any assistance of contacts or any type of glasses, we have 20-20 vision, but we'll not see the things of God. There's only one way we can hear God. There's only one way we can see God, and that is as He has revealed Himself in the written Word and the living Word, the Word of God in Jesus Christ through the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why at our church we have a vision to help people to believe in Christ and to belong to a church and to become disciples of Christ. We believe that because that enables us to fulfill our mission, or I should say, our mission enables us to fulfill our vision. Our mission is to help people to grow up in the Lord, in the Word, and to grow together as a church body. But I believe there's something to be said about the power of corporate anointing. There's some things that are not going to happen in my life unless it happens within the community of faith in community with other believers as I'm sitting and studying the Word of God. And when Jesus was talking to individuals, he was telling them, get your individual life worked out, but make sure that you are in community with other believers. 
And Satan not only will rob you of the integrity of the Bible, but he'll do everything he can to thwart your spiritual growth, whatever that may mean, whatever he has to do. You know, he's a very cunning and wise individual. He's not all wise, only God is all wise. Only God is omnipotent, only God is omniscient, only God is omnipresent, but Satan wants to do everything he can do to thwart your spiritual growth. He already had the Pharisees duped. He had them fooled. They made a decision they were gonna reject the word of God, and Jesus said, now because you've rejected me, I'm gonna to speak to you in parables, and the only way you're going to understand the parable is through belief in Jesus Christ and pressing in with a desire to know what is true. I hope you know Christ today. And it is my prayer that you will press in and get to know him more. But this parable gives us another truth. This parable gives us the truth about a parable and a precaution. Jesus loved his audience enough to not only tell them where they're going wrong, but tell them how to make things right. We would call this today repentance. Repentance is an old fashioned word, it's found in the Bible. It's part of New Testament preaching. It ought to be part of our teaching and preaching at Cross Community Church. It ought to be part of the evangelical church. It ought to be part of the Pentecostal movement. It ought to be part of Christianity today because without repentance, none of us can experience the fullness of God. Repentance means basically that I'm gonna agree with God that he's right and that I'm wrong. And Jesus was calling his audience to agree with him that he was right and that they're wrong, but they refused to do that. So he spoke to them in parables and then he said this, he gave them three precautions to be aware of. And I think this is a proposed a day more than ever before. So if you're listening this morning, say amen. I want us to hear the word of God because we read something in this text beginning in verse 18 that is very, very profound. Hear the parable, he said. I want you to hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what, he's been, what has been sown in his heart. And this is what was sown along the path. And for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet it has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. And when tribulations or persecutions arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the world and word, and it proves unfaithful. As for the one that was sown on good soil, this is the one that hears the word. Push pause for just a moment. I want to share three things with you very quickly. If you're taking notes, make sure you write this down. Maybe you have a photographic memory and you're going to tuck it away in the folds of your mind and the recesses of your soul. If you have a Bible, take an ink pen and write these in the margins of the Bible. Do whatever you have to do because this is the clear teachings of Scripture. This is the first precaution that Jesus offered. He said, first of all, we need to know that Satan, he will hinder us from receiving the Word of God. He said in this parable that Satan was the one that came and took the seed that was sown but was just laying loosely. Some of you are gonna hear the word right now. You might come under a little bit of a conviction and you might say, well, I'm gonna make a change, but you leave today and Satan is going to do everything he can do to take from you the word of God. He'll do it by making you grumpy or causing you to be grumpy. He'll do it by tempting you. He'll do it by leading you into some kind of a temptation. He'll do something, whatever he has to do to hinder you from reading the word. And here's how I know this. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, that the Satan, he is the God with a little g of this world, and that he has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is why we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that we are to be sober-minded. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. Be watchful. This is written to Christians, not those people over yonder, whoever over yonder refers to. 
He's referring to Christians. He says, your adversary, who is the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Secondly, this text tells us that not only will Satan hinder us from receiving the word, but this text tells us also that there is superficial Christianity that will hinder us from receiving the word. Remember what he said in the parable, there were those who were like the seed that was sown on shallow soil, rocky soil, that it started growing, but it fizzled out, it faded away. Perhaps true conversion never happened. Perhaps it did happen, but this is the text that tells us that these people were superficial at best. These are the kind of people that are not rooted in a local church. These are the kind of people that just drift from church to church, always looking for something new, always looking for the next dog and pony show, always looking for the next miracle, always looking for the next experience. Whatever Satan can do to keep you superficial, he will do that. But you know that, (laughs) I heard it put this way, Church is like a swimming pool. All the noise is in the shallow end. (laughs) Superficial Christianity is that way. I was reading the other day in Colossians chapter 2 as part of my own personal Bible reading and devotion, something Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. This text was written to believers. This is what Paul says. He says to be rooted and grounded as you've received Christ so you walk in him, be rooted and grounded and built up in him, established in your faith and abounding with thanksgiving. You can be solid or you can be superficial. The ball is in your court. And then there's something else that Jesus gives in this parable. He says that society's seduction will hinder us from receiving the word. It amazes me how profoundly practical this ancient parable is today. Notice what he said, but some soil fell on, some seed fell on soil that appeared to be good. In fact, it was so good that it had equal amounts of thorns growing up in it. I loved landscaping. When I went through seminary, I landscaped on the side. I'm re-landscaping my yard perpetually. I'd like for you to come by. I like to show my yard off. I think I have the nicest yard on my street. Here's what I know. It takes a lot of work to have a beautiful lawn. You do not have to irrigate or water or fertilize weeds. They just come up naturally, but you have to work at keeping them out and making sure the grass is green, and making sure the flowers are fruitful. It takes hard work. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus said that when some of this seed is sown, it's sown in soil that is so good that other plants are theirs, thorns that choke out the word of God. And then he says this, that is equivalent to the cares of this world, the seduction of riches, You know, society can seduce us and the world can woo us. It's so profound that Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is what Paul said in verse 9 to a young pastor in Ephesus. He said, I know you're going to have people in your church that are wealthy. The root of all evil is not money. The root of all evil is the love of money. If you have it, thank God that he's given you the ability to acquire it. Use it for his glory. But this is what the word says. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And it is through this craving that some have wandered away and pierced themselves with many, many, many pangs. Take the parable at face value. Press in to know the meaning. Because Jesus gives us another truth in this parable. He said, truth number one is that this parable is connected to a principle. Truth number two, this parable is connected to a prophecy. Truth number three, this parable is connected with three precautions. But then he says, truth number four is that this parable is connected to a pattern. And brothers and sisters, I want you to tuck this away in your mind. I encourage you to lean in right now and hear the word of God. 
because this is where we must draw the line in the sand. And we must say, we're going to ensure that our heart is good soil. Maybe you're here this morning and your heart is hard, it's calloused, you're worried, you're stressed, you're anxious. Maybe you should just ask God through the work of the Holy Spirit to till the soil of your heart because this is what the text says. Jesus said, but there was some of this seed that was sown on good soil. This is the one that hears the word and understands it and bears fruit and yields much fruit, some a hundredfold, some 60, another 30. In ancient Palestine, a bumper crop would have been eight to one or 10 to one. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's taking this image from their own agrarian society and he's saying, with perfect rain and perfect soil and all the right farming and tending to the crop, at best, you're going to get eight to one or 10 to one. But when you receive the word of God, something supernaturally happens in you and you will bear fruit. And it's going to be exponential, 30, 60, 100 fold. The greater emphasis is on who is causing this exponential bumper crop. It is God through the person of the Holy Spirit, as you and I receive his word. This is profound to me. It lets me know that there is a promise that every one of us in here this morning can and ought to embrace, that God has said to me and you, if you will embrace this, heaven is endorsing the authority of this, and I have sworn myself to an oath, I'm going to fulfill it in your life. Brothers and sisters, this is good news. We ought to give God a huge ovation of praise because he's not finished with us. We hope you'll join us in person for one of our services. Every Sunday, we meet at 8 a.m. in Palm Beach Shores and at 10 a.m. in Palm Beach Gardens. You can find more information on our website, crosscommunity.cc, or on Facebook and Instagram, at Cross Community Church. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great week.